Number one says select all true statements about the graph that represents y equals 2x times x minus 11. So currently, this is in intercept form since we've got two things multiplied by each other. So we have the 2x and we have that times the x minus 11. So this is in intercept form. So this first question asks us about the x-intercepts. So the x-intercepts are what make either of these two factors zero so that the whole function will be zero. So if 2x equals zero, then the whole function is zero. So we can divide by two and we get that one of our x-intercepts is zero. Then also if x minus 11 equals zero, that would be another one of our x-intercepts. So we can add 11 to both sides and get x equals 11 as another x-intercept. So I guess the first three here are about x-intercepts, the specific ones. So if we look, we know that 0, 0 has to be an x-intercept and then also positive 11, 0. So that means that b is correct and a and c are not. Also, D says that it only has one intercept. Well, it has two, so this one is incorrect. Then it starts talking about the vertex. And I'm just going to draw a quick sketch here of the function. So if we have this and we know that we've got an x-intercept at 0 and we have one at 11, and then we know that parabolas are symmetrical, around their vertex. So we've got um, this line that goes through the vertex that cuts this parabola in half. So we know that that's happening directly in the middle of the two x-intercepts. So if we just find the middle of those two numbers by adding them together and then dividing by two, we end up with that middle x value. So in this case, we end up with 11 divided by two which is 5.5 for that x value. So it's not at negative 4.5, it's not at 11, and it's not at 4.5, it is at 5.5. So h would be the correct answer for the vertex. Number two, select all equations whose graphs have a vertex with the x coordinate at two. So again, remember that the vertex is directly between the x-intercepts. So if we take our one of our x-intercepts and we add the other x-intercept and divide by two, that gives us the x-coordinate of the vertex. So these are all written in x-intercept form. So what will make this factor zero is if this was two. So the x-intercept here is two. And here is 4, because 4 minus 4 is 0. So then we can find the x of the vertex by finding the middle of those two values. So 2 plus 4 divided by 2. So 6 divided by 2 gives us 3 for the vertex there, or the x value of the vertex at least. So here, so then that would be not true, because we're looking for an x coordinate of 2. So this one would not be right. And then this one has an x-intercept at 2 and at negative 2. So it's not going to have a vertex of 2 since that's one of the x-intercepts. Um, but if you wanted to go through and find the x-coordinate, you could just do 2 plus negative 2 divided by 2. So that's 0 divided by 2. So the x-coordinate here would be 0. Part 3 has an x-intercept at 1 and at 3. And right in between 1 and 3 is 2. So C is correct. Um, and if you wanted to actually go through the work of finding it, so 1 plus 3 is 4 divided by 2 gives us 2. But it really, it's just right in the middle, right? The vertex is right in the middle. So 2 is right in the middle of 1 and 3. Um, D gives us an x-intercept of 0 and of negative 4. So directly between 0 and negative 4 is negative 2, so this is wrong. Again, you can go through the work of finding it as well if you need to. So 0 plus negative 4 is negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. 
And then this last one has x intercepts at 0 and at 4. Halfway between 0 and 4 is 2. So that will have an x intercept of 2. So 0 plus 4 is 4. Divided by 2 gives us 2. Number three, determine the x-intercepts and the x-coordinate of the vertex for each one. So again, these are all in, in x-intercept form. So our x-intercept makes each factor zero. So here it's going to be zero. And for this factor, it's going to be positive two since two minus two is zero. So then for the vertex, we're going to find the middle of those. So we're going to go zero plus two and then divide that by two, which gives us one. Second one has x-intercepts at positive 4 and at negative 5. So we're going to go 4 plus negative 5 and divide that by 2. So 4 plus negative 5 is negative 1, and then divided by 2 gives us negative 1 half or negative 0 0.5. Then the third one, we have an x-intercept at 0 for this first part. And then here, if we plug in 3, 3 minus 3 gives us 0. So 3 is the other x-intercept. So we'll do 0 plus 3 divided by 2. So 0 plus 3 is 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. Number 4, which one is the graph for this equation written in x-intercept form? So we know that the graph that we're looking for will cross the x-axis at 3 and at negative 5. So we're looking for it to cross at 3 and negative 5. So this is at negative 3 and negative 5. So this one's not right. This one's at positive 3 and positive 5. So not that one. This one is at negative 3 and positive 5. So that's not right. And then this one is at negative 5 and at positive 3. So this graph would be the correct one. Number 5, what are the x-intercepts of the graph of y equals x minus 2 times x minus 4? So 2 would make this factor 0 and 4 would make this factor 0. And then if we wanted to write them as ordered pairs, it would be the point 2, 0, and 4, 0. Then it says find the coordinates of another point on the graph, and you can pick whatever you want. So you can literally choose any x value you want to plug into here, and you just plug it in for each of the points. So I'm just going to show you how to do a couple points. Um, so I'm just going to plug in x equals 1. So I'm going to figure out what that ordered pair would be. So we know that x, we're looking for the y. So y equals 1 minus 2 times 1 minus 4. So I'm just plugging in for the x here. So y equals negative 1 times negative 3, um, which gives us positive 3. So if we plug in 1, we get positive 3. And you could um, find the y-intercept if you wanted to. I feel like, I mean, this is easy, but I feel like plugging in 0 is pretty easy also. So if you plug in 0, then this would be 0 minus 2 times 0 minus 4. So that's just negative 2 times negative 4, and you get positive 8. So when we plug in 0, we get 8. And so that's actually the y-intercept. So then it says, let's just draw a sketch of this. And again, you didn't have to plug in multiple points into here. I just did. So our graph, um, or our x-intercepts are 2 and 4. So let me just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here. So they're going to cross at 2 and at 4 is where the x's are going to cross. And then the y-intercept was at 0, 8, so way up here somewhere. And then the vertex, or not the vertex, um, just plugging in 1 gave us back 3. So then that parabola is going to be something like this. And if you had wanted to find the vertex, right, you could have just found, 
if you plugged in three, what the Y value was there if you wanted to find the vertex um, as well. Number six, a company sells calculators. If the price of the calculators in dollars is P and the company estimates that it will sell 10,000 minus 120 P calculators, write an expression that represents the revenue in dollars from selling the calculators priced at P. So remember, revenue is the number of a product sold. So how many things did you sell? times what did you sell them for? So what was the price that you sold them at? So here's how many things we sold. This is the number sold represented by 10,000 minus 120 P. So this is how many calculators we're gonna sell. And then we're gonna sell them at P dollars. So the price is P. So this would be our revenue expression right here. Number seven is S plus T squared equivalent to S squared plus 2ST plus T squared. Explain or show your reasoning. So I'm going to do the area model for this one. And so we have S plus T times S plus T. So this box here gives us S squared because it's S times S. This one is S by T, so that's just ST. This one is S by T as well, so S times T. And then this last box is T by T, so T squared. So we have one S squared, right? So we've got an S squared. And then we have one, two STs. And then we have one T squared. So yes, it is equivalent um, to that. Number eight, Tyler is shopping for a truck. He found two trucks that he likes. One truck sells for $7,200. A slightly older truck sells for 15% less than that. How much does the older truck cost? So there's a couple ways that you can do this. So one is to figure out what is 15% of 7,200. And that means to take 7,200 times 15% as a decimal. So remember, we just divide that by 100 and you get 0.15. So if you multiply these, this is what 15% is. So remember that the older truck is 15% less than 7,200. So now that we figured out the 15%, the then we can subtract that from the 7,200. And that will give us that the truck costs 6,120. So that's one way to do it by figuring out the 15% and then subtracting it from the original price. The other way, if you wanna do it directly, is to say if it's 15% less, then it's 85% of the price. So we could just do 7,200 times 85%, which is 15% less than 100%. And this would get you directly to the $6,120 and you wouldn't have to subtract. So either way is fine. Number nine, here are the graphs of two exponential functions, f and g. The function f is given by 100 times 2 to the x, while g is given by a times b to the x. Based on the graphs of the function, what can you tell about a and b? So I'm just going to highlight f here since it's not in color. So I'm just going to, that's the f function. And we're trying to come up with what we know about a and b of the g function. So remember that this is the starting point, okay? So this is the starting value of f, and we see that g starts below that. So we know that this a value has to be less than 100, okay? Because it needs to start below that. We actually also know that it's greater than zero because we can see it above um, the x-axis there. So a is bigger than zero but less than 100, then this is our growth factor, right? How fast F is growing. 
and um, G is growing faster than it. So G is getting steeper faster. So that means that for G, the B value is going to be greater than two. We don't know how much bigger than two. We don't really have an upper limit to it, but we do know that it has to be bigger than two. Suppose G takes a student's grade and gives a student's name as the output. Explain why G is not a function. So what's happening here is you're saying, okay, so we look at a grade and it gives a student name, right? Now, in order for this to be a function, each grade can only give back one student name. If there's multiple different student names at the same grade, then this wouldn't be a function. And we know that we can have, you know, multiple students can have the same grade, right? So multiple students can have the same grade. So there isn't a unique output for every input. And if you wanted to give a specific example of this, right, you could say 85%, like 85% in the class could give us back student A or student B or maybe even student C, right? So these, all of these people have an 85% or could have an 85%. So then that's not going to be a function.